required implants, dental alveolar surgery, everything requires a little bit of planning. Uh, the better your planning, in my opinion, the smoother your intraoperative experience, the better your result ultimately makes life better for you as a surgeon. And of course, uh, what we most want to do is provide the best level of care to our patients. So planning your orthognathic surgery uh, is very important. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways to plan. There's a lot of different ways to uh, figure out what kind of movements you want to do and how you figure that out. And I'm going to go over some of the basics and also talk about what I do because I like to keep things as simple as I can and also talk a little bit about model surgery and virtual surgical planning. So, in general in the U.S., um, it's thought about 10% of the population have are class two malocclusions, 2% uh, of which actually require uh, surgical intervention. Class three malocclusions uh, are much less, uh, two and a half percent of the population, but almost half require surgical intervention. Um, etiology for thinofacial deformities, there may be some genetics involved, there may be some uh, congenital defects, um, and a lot of other things, but in general, in my experience, it's just uh, uh, bad luck, so to speak. It's uh, oftentimes how you were born for no good reason, uh, you've developed that. Uh, sometimes you can develop, um, uh, especially anterior open bites from parafunctional habits, thumb su sucking, tongue thrust. Uh, there are other uh, local reasons to have uh, dental facial deformities. Some of it may be due to uh, premature loss of primary dentition or premature, uh, uh, not premature, but, but lack of eruption of adult teeth, missing teeth, etc. So, evaluation of a patient with uh, dental alveolar, or sorry, dental facial deformities. Um, with anything else, you have to interview the patient. Uh, find out why they're here. Find out their medical history, their surgical history, um, and find out what their goals are. It's very important, I think, especially when you're doing complicated surgery um, on somebody that is elective. So by elective, it's, this is a surgery that while you're making the patient's life better, you're not doing orthognathic surgery to save their life for the most part, unlike oncology surgery uh, that we do here. Uh, so it's important that everyone is on the same page, uh, the patient and the surgeon and the patient's family, to make sure that there are no surprises along the way uh, and there's no kind of untoward outcome that they weren't anticipating, that sort of thing. So you really have to spend time uh, talking to the hey, patient and getting a feel for what their expectations are, so everyone's on the same page. Then, of course, uh, you're a doctor. You need to get good, comprehensive medical history, surgical history, review of systems, and then you do your exam, intraoral exam, extraoral exam, uh, uh, TMJ exam, um, uh, functional assessment, meaning opening, closing, how, how large are they open, what's the range of movement, is there any TMJ issues, crepitus, clicking, things like that, because what we do, in some cases, may make it better, in other cases, may make it worse. So, before I actually lay my hands on a patient, I just look at them, I look at their face, and the goal of orthognathic surgery is to recreate facial balance, okay? And we look at the face, uh, initially, we look at uh, any asymmetries, uh, any uh, discrepancy in facial proportions. Um, you know, scleral show, outer base width, uh, incisal show, things like that. So we're looking for symmetry. Uh, you can also divide the face into uh, vertical fifths that should be even for the most part. And you can also divide the face into, uh, from a profile standpoint, even thirds. Okay, and so what we're looking for when we just look at the patient, we're looking at balance. Now, 
from a maxillofacial and orthognathic standpoint, the most important thing that you know, we look for is this bottom facial third, where you'll notice that the bottom facial third, now all these thirds are equally distributed, but you'll notice that the bottom facial third is broken up into two parts, from the alar base to the commissure is one third. That, that, um, that distance then, twice of that, is commissure to chin, okay? So that's sort of what we're looking for in an ideal uh, world. Now, that being said, you know, you may not be able to achieve exactly that, but at least you have some goals in mind. Part of our work, up again, also is just looking at the patient, but also getting good documentation. And that includes good intraoral photography and excellent extraoral photography. Um, for me, I get occlusion shots from anterior side and side, right, left, uh, occlusion photos. Uh, some people like to get photos of the arch form. Uh, I typically don't because I'll have a set of models or a CT scan where I can evaluate the arch form. Um, extraorally, the photography that I like in a bare minimum is frontal photo and repose, frontal photo with full smile. Now sometimes you have to tell these patients to smile. A lot of them who have you know, class two or class three abnormalities are not accustomed to smiling. They don't want to smile because they're self-conscious. So as a result, you have to oftentimes tell them, smile full, you need to see their teeth. Um, and then again, a, a frontal view in repose, and then a lateral view. Um, and if there's an asymmetry, you may need to do a right lateral and a left lateral. Then, you know, you look at their arch form intraorally, uh, looking for kind of alignment of teeth, um, looking for what their occlusion is, and if you need to, get a set of study models. Now, digital technology has really evolved in the last five years when it comes to orthognathic surgery. We'll talk about virtual surgical planning. Also, in the last couple of years, more and more surgeons and orthodontists are doing intraoral scans instead of uh, uh, conventional models, which has its pros and cons. As somebody who trained in the non-digital world, uh, having a set of models to hold and, and look at is something I'm used to. So it was a learning curve to switch to kind of a digital uh, modality. <clears throat> So TMJ evaluation, as I mentioned before, is very important. Uh, you know, because if there is a TMJ dysfunction, you need to document it. You need to discuss it with the patient. And certain procedures can make it worse. Uh, you know, sagittal split osteotomies can put some pressure on your temporomandibular joint. Uh, vertical ramus osteotomies, on the other hand, may be relieving uh, some of the pressure from the joint. So you may actually find uh, relief, but you have to document if there's any TMJ dysfunction. Finally, radiographic analysis. So basic radi uh, radiographic analysis in your orthognathic workup uh, includes an OPG, a panoramic x-ray, orthopentamogram, uh, whatever you'd like to call it, as well as a lateral seth. Now, that being said, CT scanning, in particular cone beam CT scanning, is starting to become more of the norm uh, you know, worldwide when working up these patients. And I think that's an amazing technology that uh, you know, is making orthognathic surgery more precise uh, as well as simpler to do. Um, when I look at Panorex, uh, OPG, I'm looking at the condyles, form, shape, I'm looking at the shape of the mandible. Uh, is there any asymmetries, any mandibular hypertrophy or atrophy? Condylar necks, are they different? Is there any condylar hyperplasia? Uh, things like that. I'm also looking for the presence of wisdom teeth. Uh, you know, some people, some surgeons like to remove the wisdom teeth at least six months prior to surgery. Um, and I think that's probably a good thing. But more often than not, in my practice, I end up taking them out simultaneously. But it's, a, it's something to note. It's a conversation to have with your patients. So from your lateral ceph, you can develop what's called a cephalometric analysis. And this is something that, in my opinion, 
should support what you're finding clinically. I, I am not somebody who believes that your surgery should be based just on your cephanalysis. I think your clinical evaluation in many ways supersedes your uh, supplementary analysis and the two of them should pretty much jive. If your clinical uh, evaluation and your cephalometric analysis sort of show much different things, something is off and you have to kind of go back and redo everything to make sure that uh, everything jives. Now again, the Seth analysis for me is something that I use as a tool to sort of reassure me that what I'm thinking clinically is consistent with what we're finding radiographically. A lot of different analyses out there, okay? And what is the purpose? To help diagnose skeletal and dental problems that cause a malocclusion, to track growth, and also to simulate orthodontic and surgical treatment. And also you can do a post-operative Seth analysis to evaluate uh, once you've done your surgery and orthodontics, how everything turned out compared to what you planned. And finally, it's very good for some record keeping. Now, when I was a much younger man training, I was so confused because there were so many uh, different analyses out there. Um, the one I think most commonly used in the States is either the Steiner analysis or the McNamara analysis. Um, you know, I know at the end of the day, we're fortunate to have um, one of my colleagues from Rutgers, Dr. Mukherjee, is here who's an orthodontist, and she's going to be talking to you about the surgical orthodontic aspect of it. Uh, so I think she can talk a little bit more about different analyses. Um, but again, a lot of different analyses out there. I think what you as a surgeon have to do is find what makes sense to you. I use a hybrid of the Steiner and McNamara, and I'll show you that in a few minutes, to figure out where I want things to go. So, <clears throat> basically, you're looking for certain points um, that allow you to relate the normal versus abnormal position of uh, the upper and lower jaws. You're looking at the skull base, you're looking at the maxilla, anterior posteriorly, vertically, mandible anteriorly, posteriorly, vertically, as well as looking at the dentition. Hopefully, if you have a good uh, uh, lateral ceph, you will have not only just heart, not only heart tissue um, points that you can evaluate, but also you should be able to get a good soft tissue profile associated with that that you can evaluate as well. <coughs> And again, this is just, you can see the outline of a good lateral ceph. It has all the heart tissue that you need to evaluate. Cella, nasion, A point, B point, orbits. Uh, you can devise Frankfurt horizontal, occlusal plane, etc. from this ceph. But you can also get an appreciation for your soft tissue. And now we don't really do this as much because things are done virtually through simulated surgery on a computer with a CT scan. But when I trained, and maybe perhaps some of you still do this, we actually would take these lateral steps and cut them up and move the upper and lower jaws to kind of see where things are going to fit and try to simulate the soft tissue changes as well with a good soft tissue uh, lateral set. So, you know, I think the ideal set is gonna have a good soft tissue profile as well as heart tissue profile. So some of the uh, bony anatomy that we have to document, you know, the glabella, um, looking at the nasion, looking at cella. Now, the problem with using cella, and this is why I don't necessarily like the standard analysis, it's based on cella or S, S point. Cella can be variable, so it can throw off your measurements. Um, so that's something to keep in the back of your head. Steiner analysis is an excellent analysis, but it's based on your cella tersica. So cella can be variable. Your skull base can be a little variable, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, Orbitale, you know, outlining your upper, upper molar incisor, your lower molar incisor, uh, so you have all these points. So again, the standard analysis 
is based on uh, <coughs> a skeletal analysis based on cella nasion, A point, anteriormost point of the maxilla, <coughs> and B point, anteriormost point of the mandible. The problem again with Steinert analysis is your cella can be variable, so it may not give you the numbers that you're looking at. Also, ethnically, <coughs> even though in the States we use Caucasian norms, those may not always be consistent when you're dealing with other ethnicities. So there are some things with the standard analysis that are not perfect. <clears throat> so again, from with a standard analysis, you basically are looking at, I look at three measurements, cell and AZ on A point, cell and AZ on B point, and then the difference between that, which is a a point, nasion, B point, and then I look at Frankfurt horizontal. Again, this cella, because of the variability of cella, it may not be an ideal way to figure out your maxillary and your posterior position, but it's a very commonly used um, measurement, um, you know, in the U.S. But it does have its limitations. <clears throat> the ideal uh, angulation, or what is considered the Caucasian norm for uh, your SNA angle, or the angle that kind of tells you the normal AP position of your maxilla is 82 degrees. So SNA ideally should be 82 degrees. If it's more than that, you have a prognathic maxilla. If it's less than that, you have a hypoplastic or retrognathic maxilla. Now again, your clinical evaluation has to coincide with what you're finding radiographically. And again, because cella may be variable, or because of uh, ethnic norms, those angles may be not quite exactly what you expect. You may see, for example, in an African-American patient, you may see that their SNA is 85, 86, but clinically they look fine because Oftentimes, African Americans are a little what we call bimaxillary protrusive, or they're a little uh, fuller in the maxilla. So you can't, my point is you can't just always go by radiographic angles. You have to have some clinical, uh, you have to compare what you're finding radiographically to your clinical evaluation. Now, to determine the anterior posterior position of the mandible, you're looking at what's called B point or selenasion B point. And that angle will help you determine if your mandible is prognathic too far forward, retrognathic too far back, and help you determine how far you have to move it one way or the other. Again, Caucasian norms, the normal angle is about 80 degrees. If it's less than that, you're hypoplastic class two. More than that, you're hyperplastic class three, prognathic. Now, the difference between your SNA and SNB is called your A and B, A point nasio, B point angle. And that is sort of determining sort of the relationship of the two jaws to one another and helps you sort of determine if you have to move one jaw, both jaws, lower jaw. Um, so looking at that A and B angle is important. So normally you would have a normal A and B if your SNA is 82, your S and B is 80, your A and B should be 2. If it becomes negative, it means you're going into a class 3 relationship. If it becomes more than 5-6, uh, you're probably going into a class 2 relationship. So those are ways to sort of also determine class 3 versus class 2. Okay. Now, as I mentioned before, because cella is variable, how I like to determine the AP position of my maxilla is based on a McNamara analysis, something called maxillary depth. Okay. It eliminates your variability of the cella. It basically is looking at the intersection between Frankfurt horizontal and a line perpendicular from nasion to A point. Ideally, that should be about 90 degrees. That's your ideal position of your maxilla. If it's a little less, 
your maxilla needs to come forward. If it's too much, your maxilla may need to go backwards. I like to use this when I look at my AP position of my maxilla to determine which way I need to move it, if at all, um, simply because it's a lot more stable than basing your AP position of your maxilla on some. So this is what I do. It's quick, it's easy, and it works for me. I have a staff. I figure out my AP position of my maxilla based on um, the McNamara maxillary depth, Frankfurt and a line. I then look at my models to try to figure out the transverse relationship, and vertically, I'm looking at things clinically. So that's sort of how I like to look at patients in general. I'm not saying this is the ideal way to do it, this is how I do it, it works for me. I'm sure if you ask Dr. Marchena, Dr. Jacob, um, you know, Dr. Lee, they probably will do it a little differently. And certainly that's something we can talk about at the end of the day. Okay, so pre-surgical treatment. Somebody had asked me before, you know, the importance of orthodontics when we do all of this. Um, things to think about pre-surgically. First of all, good hygiene. You don't want to really treat somebody who has really terrible hygiene, has significant perio disease, things like that. Because why are we doing this surgery? We're doing the surgery so that they can have a decent bite. What's the point of doing that if their teeth are about to fall out? So, you know, again, you don't want, you want to really ma maximize or make sure that they have good periodontal health as well as restorative health. Then you have to usually, 90% of the cases that I do are in conjunction with an orthodontist. Rarely I will do cases that are non-orthodontic but those are more because of insurance issues um, or, or patient preference issues, and I can get a good occlusion without orthodontic involvement. Oftentimes, these are people who had orthodontics when they were teenagers or children, and now as adults, they're able to finance the orthodontic surgery, so we do it that way. Okay, so pre-surgical orthodontics, though, in general, is, I think, a must because you want your orthodontist to set up the dentition in such a way that when you move the jaws, you get a stable occlusion, a stable bite, a functional bite. It's very important to speak to your orthodontist prior to surgery. So the best orthodontists that I work with, Dr. Mukherjee, others, will send me patients at the very beginning of treatment. Unfortunately, there are some orthodontists who will send me patients with a note ready for surgery. And, you know, I may see them, and look at them, and I'm like, there's no way I'm going to be able to, uh, you know, do this case and get a reasonable result. And so oftentimes they may have to go back to the orthodontist for extended periods of time. So that's why, you know, again, and I've been doing this now for almost 20 years, um, you have to, I can't stress, you have to have a good relationship with your orthodontist, an open line of communication, and you have to stress to the orthodontist that what it is you're hoping to achieve, what the orthodontist hopes to achieve, make sure that everyone is on the same page. From a surgical standpoint, you know, if you have, for example, an anterior open bite, typically anterior open bites are treated by segmentalizing the maxilla, changing the occlusal plane, uh, to make it a more favorable and stable occlusion. So if you're going to, for example, need to segmentalize the maxilla, you have to tell the orthodontist, okay, I need to make interdental cuts at this point, and I need you to diverge roots enough that I can get a saw in between these teeth without skewering them. Usually two, three millimeters of root separation is more than enough. Um, so talking to the orthodontist ahead of time when they're lining up and working up these cases is very important. Um, your orthodontic objectives, and Dr. Wukherjee is going to go into this far more articulately and, and succinctly than I can, but, uh, you know, in general I tell orthodontists, level and align. Straighten the teeth out, align the arches. This will help me then determine how I'm moving things, okay, and chair posteriorly vertically. I personally like to have a set of stone models. I think, um, you know, 
uh, Jose and Greg uh, and myself are from the same generation that we like to have stone models and we all sort of, it was a learning curve when we went into the digital world. But I like stone models. I like to have models in my hand and articulate them and see how things fit together. Okay, so at this point, you worked up your patient, you sent them back to the orthodontist, they've come back to you a year later after they've been leveled in the line. And again, when they come back, take a good look, do that same exam, intraoral, extraoral, TMJ, radiographic exam, get a set of models, see how things fit. The best orthodontists, in my opinion, are those who actually bring the patient back with models, so that study models, so that I can look at things and say, oh, okay, this works or it doesn't work. Go back or let's move forward with surgery. Now, if you've made that decision, okay, the patient is orthodontically ready for surgery, then you have to do what's known as the final treatment planning stage or model surgery. Okay? And again, you have to get new x-rays, new photographs, and new models to put everything together. So we'll talk a little bit about model surgery. And um, this is the basics of how you plan orthognathic surgery. Now, this, unfortunately, in my opinion, in the States, is going out the window because everything is now becoming digital. I do ask my residents to do some basic model surgery because I think it's very important. Uh, I think it's very important that they understand how to do this for a variety of reasons, but I feel that doing the model surgery gives me a really good idea of what's going on in the OR when I'm in the OR, um, thinking and seeing how things move. Um, so. <clears throat> now, traditional model surgery depends on getting a good face bone uh, relationship, especially if you're doing two jaw surgery. You have at this point, mounted your casts with a good face bow, and usually you require two sets of casts if you're doing double jaw surgery. If you're doing single jaw surgery, theoretically you can just use uh, one set of casts and move one jaw. Prior to doing the actual cutting up of the models, you've done a cephalometric analysis, sort of how I told you before, trying to figure out, okay, I'm gonna move the maxilla this far forward, the mandible this far back, I looked at the models to see how things fit transversely, if I have to widen my maxilla or not. And then clinically, I've looked at clinical photos to see my vertical change, what I need to do. So again, you have to think about things three-dimensionally, okay? Um, and, and your model surgery, from that, you generate splints, okay? The splints are what are gonna guide you intraoperatively so you're not eyeballing things. If you don't have good face bone, if you don't have good models, if you don't have a good model surgery, or if you make crappy splints, you're not gonna have fun in the operating room. So when, when we do this, we're very meticulous about making sure each step is accurate and done well. Three-dimensional considerations, yaw, roll, pitch. So we have to think about, especially with the maxilla, in three dimensions, how your surgery is going to change that position. Okay, very important. Uh, you know, I'm somebody who, the way that I was trained, if I'm doing two jaw surgery, nine times out of ten, I'm doing maxilla first, and that's a conversation that I think Dr. Jacob and I can have uh, because even though we're platonic partners, we do things differently. Uh, he advocates oftentimes doing mandible first. I like doing maxilla first. So uh, we can talk at the end of today about why each of us do what. In my feeling, in my opinion, you have a stable mat. You have to get your maxilla where you want it. Once you have the maxilla uh, in that position that you want, your mandible just follows. So again, it's very important to think of your maxilla in three dimensions. Now again, you have to make sure that the mounting is adequate. It's acceptable. 
it is identical to your photographs, your clinical photographs, okay? You have to make sure that everything is the same on the mounting that you find intraorally, okay? Do the photos and mountings match? If something's off, as I mentioned before, this will then not allow you to have an accurate surgery. You've sort of figured out from your set prediction tracings the movements that you want to do. Um, enter posteriorly, vertically, transversely. So I'm going to use this case as an example. Okay, um, this is a 20-year-old uh, lady comes to me, and what do I see? So I notice that in repose, I don't really see, barely see her upper upper centrals. Um, she doesn't have an open bite, but her teeth are sort of hanging out apart. There is a uh, mandibular asymmetry. Her chin point is not uh, symmetric with her, uh, coincident with her facial midline. She certainly has uh, some uh, mid-face deficiency as well, uh, and a dorsal hump. Intraorally, what am I seeing? I'm seeing a large open bite, uh, as well as a class three malocclusion. Okay, so um, just looking at these photos, I already, in my head, I'm thinking about, okay, what do I need to do to fix, fix all this? Okay, this is her post-leveling and aligning pre-surgery set. It's not the best set, because I mentioned before, it doesn't have a great soft tissue profile, but it has enough for me to figure out what I need to do. And this is her panoramic radiograph as well large open bite, you can see that the orthodontist has provided me plenty of space to make my inner dental cuts. Okay, so <clears throat> she had an anterior open bite and she's also class three. Um, she does, didn't show a lot of teeth at smile, um, didn't show anything at rest. So I know that one, because of the size of the open bite, I have to segmentalize her maxilla. Okay, posteriorly impact the maxilla, uh, as well as move the anterior segment of the maxilla into an aesthetically favorable position. And then I have to move, once I figured out where the maxilla is going, I have to move the mandible into that maxilla. So, <clears throat> because of my clinical and cephalometric analyses, I figured that for good tooth show, I need to bring the maxilla forward a little bit, three millimeters, and down the anterior three millimeters. Posterior maxilla has to go back up four millimeters. Uh, in this particular case, I also put in cheek implants. I also segmentalized her. Now, a basic rule of thumb for me is when somebody has an anterior open bite, for every three millimeters open, I impact the posterior segments by a millimeter. So she had, for example, a six millimeter open bite. I impacted those posterior segments of the maxilla two millimeters up to change out of the oozal plane to a more favorable and stable uh, relationship. So I have my mounted models. I've checked to make sure that they mimic the photography that I have. Okay, open bite pragmatic, and she also had a cant, so I need to stretch.